So I was on the ferry a couple weeks ago with my son, my youngest son, and we were going to a swim meet in Victoria. And I thought rather than him spending the entire time on his iPod, I would go and buy something educational. So I went and bought one of those little retro books with the, the, the invisible ink and the white pen with the orange lid. And it was called, Are You Smarter Than a Fifth Grader? So I figured this was pretty much perfect because he's in sixth grade and I'm old enough that I wear a watch. So we're good to go. So we sit down and we open the book and the first question says, how many equal angles are in an isosceles triangle? I think, wow, I'm sure at some point I knew that. <laughs> but I don't know that anymore. So last week I'm out for drinks with a friend and she says, I've got this pain in my side. And I think, oh, not a problem. I'm a physiotherapist and I teach anatomy. And she said, so which side is your appendix on? 50-50. I had to Google it. So you're now sitting here thinking, who invited this relatively uneducated woman? <laughs> to come and present at TEDx. But the reality is I wanted to illustrate with those humiliating moments um, that what our children are learning in school, it might not be sticking. And is that just something, is that a reality we have to accept? Or is there something that maybe as parents that we can do to facilitate things a little bit? So um, first of all, every child's brain is unique. And some of these strategies and tips will work for your child, some won't. But what we do know is there's a tremendous amount of new literature about the brain, a lot of research. And we know that the, the child's brain develops till about age 25. So now's the time to have an impact. So have a look at this string of numbers. Say it out loud in your head if you want to. That information has gone into your sensory memory. Okay, and so it's residing right now in your optic nerve and in the brain centers for your eyes, for your ears. Um, and it, it resides in there for about 20 seconds, which is why I'm nattering on here. So the reality is, if I were to ask you by now, it's probably eroded enough. Does anyone dare raise their hand and try to string off that set of numbers? Where we really work is our working memory. Okay, so as I'm speaking right now, um, information is going in your working memory. And you are manipulating it. You're playing with it and thinking, oh, I can work with that, I disagree with that. This fits with my prior understanding of the way I view the world. So working memory is great, but in two weeks, you'll be at a barbecue and you'll be with some friends and they'll say, oh, you were at TEDx. Did you see Tracy? And you'll say, oh yes, she was exceptional. <laughs> and they'll say, what, what did she talk about? And you'll think, she doesn't know her triangles. <laughs> you will probably remember 20% of what I say right now. And that's the sad reality about the working memory, is that a fellow named Ebenhaus over 100 years ago looked at how quickly lecture-based content is lost. And the reality is in two weeks, about 80% is gone. Worse than that, in 24 hours, up to half is gone. Think about your child in high school who has academic subjects every second day. So this presents a pretty significant problem. We need to get information into the long-term memory. The good news is, finally, we have a storage area which actually holds things. Okay, so we don't lose things. Current literature tells us, actually, once it makes it into long-term memory, it's there for good. So this is great. It's got hundreds of computers worth of capacity, and it's quite so solid. <clears throat> but how do we get it there? How do we make sure that information makes it into our long-term memory? First of all, we need to recognize um, that there are different types of long-term memories. There are episodic memories and there are semantic memories. Okay, so episodic memories are remembering that first bicycle you got. Mine was purple. It had a banana seat and I will never forget getting that. Those type of memories are very valuable, but that's not what we typically think of when it comes to schooling. We think of semantic learning and memories. So these two types of memories reside in the long-term memory systems and the real trick is to weave the two of them so that we don't have some in some parts of the brain and some in the other. We want to have them weaved. So if we come back to Ebenhaus's curve, if you have a look at that, you'll see that, that the next thought was, oh, good news, if we just have the student go back every 24 hours or so and review the notes, then we can keep that curve from happening and they're not gonna lose it. Well, I've got news for you. I've, I've got three kids and they don't do this. And I, I think 
it would be a rare situation that a child would do this. Um, I have a, a grade nine son, a grade eight daughter, and a grade six son, um, and I'm wowed by what they're learning. My, my grade six is in this inquiry-based learning and asks so many questions and, and strikes me as, as quite intelligent. Um, my, my older two are learning what I think is light years ahead of what I was learning at their age. So I'm excited about their learning, but they're not this keen. And when I ask them if they have homework, most of the time they've already gotten it done as quickly as they can get it done. They're not going to go back and do this review work. Um, there are a lot of techniques they know that do work. Flashcards work, sure. If we're trying to memorize things like times tables or French verbs um, that I think my son has learned maybe 12, 13 times. Um, so there are methods that we can use to refresh it and to keep that erosion of material from going, from, from you know, creating that loss of, of semantic learning. The one reassuring thing as a parent is if your child struggles in school, they're actually at an advantage. Because if a concept is really hard to learn, we form deeper neural connections. So that math tutor is money well spent. That those concepts that are harder for your child to learn are actually ones that they're probably more likely to hang on to. Here's another thing that will maybe conflict with the way you would view study habits. I would suggest that when your child is sitting at their desk when they are studying, go and interrupt them about every 20 minutes and ask them to do something with you. Play ping pong, play catch. Now they might get tired of doing it with you, but the idea is they've, they've now found that the brain centers where we carry out our psychomotor domain, our, our physical skills, our, our activities, um, that's a really healthy way to switch off from learning and then switch back into what we've been studying. And that when we do that, we reload that information, and again, we wind up with deeper neural connections. So it's actually a really good idea. So if your child says, ah, oh, I've been studying for 20 minutes, and you think, well, that's not very long, and they're already going out to shoot hoops, tell them that's actually a great idea, as long as they're coming back. Um, so then when we, we get into trying to figure out where the problem is, whether it is a coding problem in the first place, that they didn't really understand the material, whether it's a retention problem, or I think in my case, much of the time, it's a retrieval problem. So going back to that triangle, I'm sure it's somewhere in my long-term memory, but I've lost the ability to hook my grade seven math file in my long-term memory. It's, it's just not there, it's just not readily accessible. So this is a collage of a lot of experiences that my kids have had. Um, we have become travel junkies, and uh, we do it in, in Fairly low budget ways, we do home exchanges, we stay in hostels. Um, my kids have been to 29 countries. So we drag them to these places thinking that um, at some point they might say to us, you know, can't we go to Disney World? But the reality is kids eat it up. And what we've come to realize is that as parents, this is our role. Our role is to provide context. It doesn't mean you need to travel the world. IMAX movies are amazing and they bring the world right to you. Um, there's a tendency to think, well, yeah, I took my child to the zoo when he was six and we used to do Science World, but he's kind of outgrown it. They don't. They still really like those experiences, particularly if you can bring them in contact with an expert in their field. The, the guides in all the American uh, national parks are phenomenal. They bring it alive. We went to Mesa Verde cliff dwellings in Colorado and my kids will never forget how spiritual that guide was. Those type of experiences. My daughter's doing a uh, project right now that she has to build a castle. And she came to me, she's in grade eight, and she came to me and she said, oh, um, can, can you uh, get up that picture? I just want to show my friend when I was kissing the Blarney Stone. And so she's able to draw on these past experiences with her future learning, or the other way around. We're reaffirming some of that learning that she's done in class. So we're providing that context. We're providing opportunities for really rich neural connections, for associations. Encourage your child to be an expert. Um, it may seem at the time that they really need to know this much about sports teams. Sure, why not? There's a lot of information you can hang off of that. So having these networks of information, whether it's about Lego, whatever they want to become an expert in, that's a good thing and it allows for them to, to load other information onto it, and it just creates more passion about learning on a subject. Emotion. 
we tend to remember things that have a visual impact that affect our emotions, um, or perhaps that are particularly dramatic or shocking to the senses. Um, and I think probably the best illustration I can make of this is when we were in Normandy in, in northern France. Um, my husband actually teaches social studies, so I always sort of expect him to put on a social studies teacher hat, and he doesn't actually. To his credit, um, what he more wants our kids to develop is, is this real sense of, of grit um, and, and also this, this real sense of exploring the world. So when we were there, we had had the kids watch the opening scene to Saving Private Ryan first, and it is extremely dramatic. Um, it, it, it's maybe not appropriate for younger kids, but uh, certainly for any high school age kid, I think they should see it. So they're coming up on, onto the beach, and really they don't stand a chance in the scene. And so um, for the kids, first of all, we went swimming on that very beach after they'd seen it. And I, I honestly think my older son kept, kept looking to see if maybe that there would be a wounded man lying on the beach because it, it felt so real. But the really big impact was when we then went to the cemetery. We went to the US cemetery, and we looked up the names of the three brothers that that movie is based on, the three brothers that all died, which is why they went to try to find the fourth one who still was living. And we found the name of those three brothers, and we went and we found the three tombstones. And the, the experience of that coming to life, it was real, right? So now, that's not just a movie, and that's not just World War II, and that's not just Socials 9. That's, this really happened, right? And so now my son who's learning it in Socials 9, he's really excited about it. It's real for him. So I think that was probably the biggest impact we had in terms of a real emotional um, reaction. With respect to emotions, we should be really aware of the fact that negative emotions inhibit the, the prefrontal cortex where all that working memory takes place. So if your child is going to school and they're feeling anxious, sad, scared, they're just not going to be nearly as capable as, as they potentially could be. So recognizing that there is a need to have those addressed. Sleep. I don't know about you, but I'm fed, to, fed up to death of being told that my kids don't sleep enough, so I'm not gonna harp on that. But what I am gonna say is that your child may say to you, particularly a teenager, may say, it's okay. I, I, I'm going to pull an all-nighter, but it'll be just fine because I'm just going to cram. I, I got to get this information in. And so perhaps you do let them do this, and perhaps they get three or four hours of sleep that night. And then you might be a little bit almost disappointed when they say, oh, I rocked it. I did really well. And you think, I don't know what these researcher, researchers are talking about because in reality, my child is so smart, he doesn't even need to sleep. <laughs> so here's the problem. If your child does that, make sure they don't throw away any of their notes. Because remember that Evan House curve? They put it in their working memory. By the time final exams come, it's gone. Because sleep is where we transfer things from working memory to long-term memory. So without at least seven hours of sleep, that information is just going to gradually erode. So you may want to just tell them that, that either they need to adopt a better sleep regimen or keep those binders tidy because you're going to need to relearn that later. Um, motivation. I think as a parent, we find it very hard to know how, how do we make sure that our child is intrinsically motivated. That sounds a little bit odd even to say it. But we don't want to be having to push them to succeed. We want them to find their passion and we want them to, to be self-directed and self-motivated. That's tough. And so the one note I'll, I'll make on that point is that the studies on, on motivation and dopamine receptors in the brain tell us that if, if we reward our children, so if we stoop to the level of paying for grades, I uh, haven't done that, but I did buy a tablet for my daughter when she got her math grade from a C to a B, and I'm still not sure if I regret that or not. But what happens is when they are rewarded, their dopamine reaction is to the reward. So they've now had this really positive reaction, but it's to, for my daughter, I'm worried that now she thinks prizes, right, tablets rather than, I really can rock at algebra. So we really have to be careful, because I find it's a, it's a tough one, because even praising them for success, are they then striving for that praise? So I'm not saying you don't want to praise your kids, but certainly 
recognizing that we need to just allow them to feel the genuine success you get from working hard and accomplishing what you know you're capable of doing. Um, Gary mentioned earlier today about Maslow's hierarchy of needs and uh, the third level there is that love and belonging. So never forget that that's your real role, right, as a mom or as a dad, that you want to set up their life so that they recognize that they are truly loved and they belong because these all need to be met for their memories to be working effectively while they're at school. Um, one of the things that's interesting about memory is when we look at episodic memory, we actually remember the most from age 15 to 25. So it's kind of bad news if you think you've done this excellent job of raising them and then they become teens and your, your relationship becomes a little bit dicey because that's what they're going to remember. So my son just turned 15 and I'm really being very nice to him <laughs> right now. Um, but just recognizing that we never should stop with, with these good parenting strategies that, that we have done when our children are younger because not only do they still need it, but they're going to remember it. The last point I'm going to make is about mindfulness, and it's a real buzzword right now, and if you're not familiar with it, uh, the two minutes I have left is not enough time to share that with you. But in today's day and age, particularly with technology, but just the pace that many of us are operating at, um, we are not always living in the now. We're often thinking about the future, or reflecting on the past, or our mind is swirling in a bunch of different directions. And I think children are quite mindful. But I do think that what's happening is with the scheduling and the programming and the practice after practice and the homework assignments and the projects, um, it's probably becoming harder for them to live in the moment. And I think one of the best things we can do is model that mindfulness. I catch myself sometimes texting while I'm listening half-heartedly to, to one of my kids telling me what they did in school and I think, stop it. Stop actively listening, process it, and really be there with them so that they can see how valuable that is because that is really effective, not only in terms of the studies they've found for, for happiness, for mental health, there's so many benefits to it, but in terms of memory, the actual only way to cause that increase in gray matter, cortical thickening, um, is through mindfulness. And, and when we look at the studies that, that look at monks, um, they have tremendous hippocampal growth um, from, from the meditation and from that true mindfulness behavior. So I will leave it at that, but thank you very much for this opportunity to share with you today.